I've been doing a series that we've been calling Hoarders Buried Alive. And if this is your first Sunday with us, or if maybe uh, uh, you know, you're a guest today and you're wondering, well, that you know, doesn't sound like a very uplifting, edifying, or even biblical topic to be hearing about in church. Uh, some of you have seen the TV program about hoarding, uh, what it looks like to be buried alive. And so we've been using a couple of different object lessons with us this morning. And, and really my heart is, when we're talking about hoarders buried alive, is really the feeling that you get when your life is like this. The feeling that, that you can't put one more thing into it. Life is packed. And if you've ever watched the television show and you've seen the homes, the conditions that people live in, and you know that they've got so much stuff in their home that, that it's like, how can you keep putting stuff in and putting stuff in? And it creates unhealthy situations. And it's, it, it could even be deadly. It's damaging the families. And it causes a lot of anxiety and pain and suffering. And, 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 and yet that application, is very appropriate for where we in America, uh, uh, you know, in, in our day and time we live in because there's a feeling that we have that we need to just cram our life, continue to put stuff into our life. And eventually, if we're not careful, our life ends up looking kind of like this, that, that there's just not room for anything else. And, and it's when we live like this that we have stress. When we, when we live like this, we have pressure. There's anxiety. We know what this kind of feels like. Uh, you know, we try to put more stuff into our time and into our schedule, and suddenly we don't have time for the important things. We don't have time for the important people, and our relationships suffer, and there's, there's argument, arguments and people complaining and things like that. And so we've been talking about this idea that life is better when there's less clutter. Life is better when there's order. Life is better when there's room. Life is better when there's space. When our life is not so jam-packed full of stuff, life is better. And a couple of weeks ago, we talked about this in our first uh, uh, session that we talked about this, that many times what drives us to put more and more stuff into our life really is fear. We're afraid that we're going to miss out. We're afraid that we're not going to have enough. We're afraid that our kids will miss out. And if we don't do this and get them to this and take them there, then, then they'll fall behind everybody else. If I don't have the latest and greatest, then people will think less about me. Or, or, or maybe somebody in your past has been saying, you'll never amount to anything. And so you filled your life with stuff to prove them wrong. But in living like this, we find out that the tyranny of the urgent begins to take over our lives, and we don't have the time for the things that are truly important or the people that are truly important. And so we're encouraging you and challenging you in some different things to instead live like this, live in such a way that there's space, that there's room, that there's time. We looked last week at Moses. Moses lived to be 120 years old. You might wonder, well, what does a guy who lived thousands of years ago have to do? How can he teach us about time? In Psalms chapter 90, he says, several different things and he gets down to the 12th verse and he says in Psalms chapter 90 and verse 12, teach us to number our days. Teach us to number our days. That right there should alert us to something that this doesn't come natural to us. This is something we have we need somebody to help us with when it comes to numbering our days. Teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. And the way we said it last week was like this, teach us to live as if our days are numbered. That puts a little bit different perspective on it. Teach us to live as if our days are numbered. I, I use this illustration, I want to use it again, uh, uh, you know, for, for moms of brides and for brides, they know what it is to live as if their days are numbered. Like I said last week, grooms, that's a totally different meaning. That's not the meaning to, to live like your days are numbered. But for, for, for brides and, and mothers of brides, there is a date. Let's just pick one out. July 17th is the date that, that you're going to be saying I do. That is, your days are now numbered and you know that you have a certain amount of time to accomplish very important tasks. You have a certain amount of time to make sure you've got a caterer, that you've got a place to have the dinner. You've got a, a, a DJ or a, or a limo or photographers or videographers. You have a certain amount of time to accomplish everything that you need to accomplish. You know what it's like to live as if your days are numbered. And that's really what, the, what, what Moses is saying to us. He's saying, Lord, help me to live as if my days are numbered. Because whether you realize it or not this morning, your days are numbered. You don't know what that number is? But our days are numbered. We, we live with the assumption that we'll always have tomorrow. We live with the assumption that the people that are in our life today will be in our life tomorrow. We live with the assumption that our kids will always be our kids and our parents will always be our parents and that our grandparents will always be there. In the back of our mind, we know that's not so, but we live that way. And so the psalmist is telling us to have a little bit different perspective of life, to live as if our days are numbered. See, our tendency is 
to fill our life with so much stuff. Our tendency is to, is to continually put stuff into our life without ever taking anything out of our life. It's to say yes to the things we want to say yes to, and, and, and we're trying to say yes to everything, and pretty soon we're too busy. And there's not space, there's not room. Our life is so cluttered up, and that's why I say that life is better with less clutter. Life is better. There's peace. It's, it's, it's where there's refreshing. It's where you sleep better. It's where, uh, where relationships can develop and grow and become richer and better over the course of your lifetime. And I think all of us would prefer to live a life that's uncluttered versus a life that is so jam-packed full that we have all kinds of stuff, but we don't enjoy the stuff that we have. And yet that's where many Americans live is they live that way. And so um, I, I, I want to talk to you a little bit about, uh, thank you. I'll actually, if you... Thanks. I want to talk to you a little bit about money this morning. Everybody say money. money. Now, first of all, just to let you know, I'm not going to ask for any, okay? So you can all just take a deep breath. We're not asking for money today. I don't want anything from you. In fact, I just want something for you. And, and really, hope that you were able to take advantage of it. Uh, uh, it just kind of worked out. Uh, Texas Roadhouse was able to be here today. They uh, provide. They had. A, they have a bunch of roles out there. Uh, uh, when when that opportunity came up, and I, I knew we were doing this series, I said, "Well, let's see if we can get them to talk. Get them to bring the roles on today. Because instead of asking you for dough, I'm going to give you some dough. And so uh, <clears throat> there you go. And uh, but when, when we're talking about money, and and I know that that's a touchy subject for some people, yet it's it is so important. And there's some passion in me this morning to, to teach on some of these things because of uh, of really my life. And and before I go too far, this is what I'd like to do. Uh, uh, we've taken our C and C cards this morning that you all faithfully diligently fill out, and I've got a I've got a gift card for Texas Roadhouse, and uh, um, yeehaw! So you can you know, take Pastor John to lunch there this afternoon. Anyway, so here we go. Uh, let's go right over here. Here, just grab one. Just don't grab your own. Hopefully y'all put your name on this. Okay, Peggy. I'm not sure who, where, is this, is this your un ineligible, uh, unintelligible writing? Okay, it was a pen. All right, here you go. There you go. Thank you so much. Just messing with you this morning. Praise the Lord. So, you know, when we talk about money, I know that there's the, the aspect of church and money and different things. People get kind of weirded out a little bit by it. But again, I, I, <clears throat> this is really important to me, and you'll understand why in a minute. But, but the principle of, of our finances, the principle of our money, the principle of being buried alive is very similar to the principle about time. Teach us to live as if our days are numbered. Because our days are numbered, because we only have a certain amount of time, we need to be very intentional and, be, and, and careful about what we do with our time. Because our time is limited, help us to use the limited amount of time that we have to the very best of our ability or really to the best of God's purpose in our life. And so the principle is similar to time. Uh, uh, I'll say it like this. Our time is limited, therefore we have to limit what we do with our time. Our time is limited, so we have to limit what we do with our time. Now, our money is similar. Our money is limited, but you don't have to limit what you do with your money. Your money's limited, but you don't have to limit what you do with it. Here's, here's the difference. You can't borrow time, but you can borrow money. You can't borrow time, but you can borrow money. The time you have is the time you have. When the time is done, when the time is over, the time is expired, and so do you. There's not more time. You can't borrow it. You can't go backwards and recapture it. You can't hit do over. You can't hit replay. You can't be in your 40s and wish that you were in your 30s or in your 50s and wish that you could go back and, and, and cover up and make up for. You can't make more time. Your time's limited, so you have to limit what you do with your time. Your money is limited, but you don't have to limit what you do with your money because while you can't borrow time, you can borrow money. And many times what happens, because our time might be limited, but our, our, our income is limited, but what we do with it, we end up filling our life with more and more stuff to the point that we don't enjoy the stuff that we have because we're buried under the debt. We're buried under the weight. We're buried under the obligation. And it's in this where there's pressure, there's anxiety, it's where relationships suffer. But this is far better. Creating space, having room in your finances so that you can enjoy, so that you can breathe, so that you can sleep better, 
rather than worried about what's going to happen, worried about those kinds of things. In Matthew chapter, or in Mark chapter four, and in Matthew chapter thirteen, we're given a parable. It's two. It's a, It's the same parable, but from two different perspectives. It's the parable of the sower who sows the word of God. And in this parable, he likens, he said, there's a guy who went out into the field. He planted a bunch of seed. He scattered seed on the ground. Some was good ground. Some was stony ground. Some was hard ground. And, and, and he said, you know, different things happened in the environment of that ground and of the day. And some of that ground produced seed. It produced crops and some of it didn't. And then Jesus came back to his disciples later and he said, this is what this actually means. The one that sows seed, the one who plants seed is the person who teaches and preaches the word of God. And the word of God is given to different hearts. Some hearts are stony ground. Some hearts are, are, are hard ground. Some is good ground, and it will produce. And, and we have this in, all of our, in, in our lives. Some, of, some parts of our life, it's good ground. Some parts, it's stony ground. Some, some parts, it's really hard ground. But I want to just kind of cherry pick a couple of verses here. In verse 13 in chapter 22, I'm sorry, chapter 13, verse 22 of the book of Matthew, he said this, Now he who receives seed among the thorns is he who hears the word and the cares of this world. Or the worry about this world. Living like this. He who hears the word of God. Receives the word of God. But the cares of this world. And the deceitfulness of riches. And the lusts. Uh, or I'm sorry. Cares of this world. And the deceitfulness of riches. Choke the word. And he becomes unfruitful. He becomes unfruitful. The cares of this life, the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches causes you and I to become unfruitful. And that's partly what we've been talking about the last couple of Sundays. The cares of life. We are so burdened down and filling our life with so much stuff that we don't have time. Remember in our very first week when we were talking, what drives us to live like this many times is fear. I'm afraid that if I don't push it to the max, I'm afraid if I don't do everything that I can do and go beyond what I can do, I am afraid that I will fall behind. If I don't have my kid at every event, they will miss out. I'm afraid that they won't measure up. And fear drives us. And yet the scripture we used, uh, Jesus said, you know, uh, don't take... Don't worry about what you're going to eat or what you're going to drink or what you're going to wear because the heavenly father knows that you have need of these things. God knows what it is that we think we might miss out on. God knows what we need. God knows that he wants our, that we want our kids to have the best opportunities in life. He knows that we want to have the best marriages, the best relationships. He knows those things, but do we trust him enough to meet that need? And so when he's giving us this parable in Matthew chapter 13, along with Mark chapter 4, when he's giving us this, this parable, he says that the cares of this life and the deceitfulness of riches entering in chokes out the word so that he becomes. We like that third person. He becomes. Let's, let's, let's make it a little more personal. The cares of this life and the deceitfulness of riches can cause me, me, to become unfruitful. Now I believe with all of my heart Every single one of you this morning would like to be able to reach the end of their life, to step into eternity and hear Jesus say, wow, you maximized every part of your life to produce for the kingdom of God. You were awesome on planet earth. Well done, good and faithful servant. I think all of us would like to hear that. And yet Jesus told us something. Jesus said that the cares of this life and the deceitfulness of riches have the potential to put us in a position where our hearts or our lives will not produce. They will be unfruitful. That's why he goes on in the next verse and, and, and he says, but he who receives seed on good ground is he who hears the word and understand it, who indeed bears fruit and produces some 100, some 60, and some 30. The cares of this life and the deceitfulness of riches can put us in a position where the word of God that we hear is unfruitful in our life. And so the deceitfulness of riches, and, 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 and we're talking about money this morning, and, and the deceitfulness of riches, please hear me this morning. I'm not saying that it is wrong to have money. I'm not saying that it's wrong to be wealthy. I'm not saying that God, uh, you know, there, there are people who were brought up in the whole idea that, you know, uh, well, that, that, that poverty and humility go hand in hand. That you shouldn't have too much. And it's kind of popular right now. You know, it's all the stinking, filthy, rich people. They're the problem. They're not the problem. Money's not a problem. 
It's wrong ideas about money. I love the scripture that Pastor John gave, Ecclesiastes 5, when, about, was it 10.5 or 5.10? Anyway, the, the scripture in Ecclesiastes, there's, there, it's foolishness to think that money is going to bring happiness. And it ties in really well with, with where we're headed this morning. You see, the deceitfulness of riches, we, there's something about wealth that has the ability to deceive us. You know, some people would say it this way, that, you know, the, that money is the root of all evil. Money is not the root of all evil. It is the love of money that's the root of all evil. You can be broke, not have a nickel, and still suffer from the love of money and the pain that is, and the deception and the deceitfulness that it brings. And so when we, when we begin to consider this this morning, and this is, a, this is a, a area that I can get real passionate about because I, I'll, just be, I'll just be totally honest with you. Shelly and I know what it's like to live like this. We know what it's like to have so much credit card debt. We know what it's like to be so upside down in your finances that there's absolutely no room, that it seems like everything is weighing in around you. It seems like every, there's pressure. We know what this feels like. We've lived here. And I can tell you right now, and many of you know this, I hated it. We hated it. There was nothing fun. But I can also tell you this morning, because of God, that we also know what it's like to have space and to have room. And I'll just tell you something right now. This is way better. This is way better. And let me also tell you this. You might feel like this is your future, and you might feel like there's absolutely no way out. Can I tell you this morning? This is possible. This is possible. I, I thought, you know, when, when Shelly and I started to put some principles into place, uh, we were pastoring out in Pennsylvania, and, and, and you know, there was some stuff that, that it was just a result of the season of life that we were in. Uh, you know, we had one child that was young, and then now we have our second one on the way, and then born, and we were pastoring a little tiny church. They paid us $600 a month. I was working full-time outside of that, and, and, and uh, you know, we were doing everything we, that we could, but it was just, it was impossible possible at that point to, to, to do any more financially than we could possibly do, than we could do at that particular point. It was a season that we we're in. There are other things that, 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 that I'll just be totally straight up honest with you. There were some things where, where Shelly or I, we were, man, we were the biggest culprits in our finances. And, and it was decisions that we made that caused us to live like this and to feel that pressure and to feel that weight. But it was also decisions that brought us to the point that there was space and that there's room. And I'll, t- I'll say it again, this is far better. This is far better. And so when I'm talking to you this morning, I'm not talking to something that we haven't lived, that we haven't experienced, that we haven't, that we haven't gone through. And, 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 and bottom line, this is what I think the deceitfulness of riches is. We are being taught in America today, you all know what the standard of living is. We're being taught in America that the standard of living is equal to the quality of life. That the higher your standard of living is, the better of quality of life that you will have. The more stuff that you have, the more that you fill your life with, the more things that you have, the higher your standard of living is. That's what advertisers do, right? Advertisers are telling us, you need the latest, you need the greatest, you need the biggest, you need the fastest, you need to live better, eat better, date better, marry better, drive better, you need to just have better, better, better. I remember a few years ago when the light went on for me, I'm driving down the road, and you've heard me share this, some of you have, I was driving down the road and I heard a car commercial come on, and the person was saying, get the car that you deserve. And all of a sudden it hit me, it's like, it wasn't get the car you can afford, it wasn't get the car that makes sense, it wasn't get the car that's practical, get the one you deserve. Because we can arrange low cost financing for you. I can tell you, man, I've lived upside down in cars. That sounds weird. I didn't actually live in a car that was upside down. I've been backwards in vehicles. I have owed more on vehicles than what they were worth. And there is nothing more frustrating. It is one of the most difficult things to get yourself out of. Because I wasn't buying a car. I was buying a car payment. I was buying the car I thought I deserved. And so we think that our standard of living and our quality of life are the same. That if I increase my standard of living, then my quality of life is going to be better. But all of you know that's not true. Many of you have experienced that. I had the car that I deserved. But my quality of life wasn't any better. In fact, it got worse. My quality of life had gotten worse. Because now I was saddled with a car payment I couldn't afford. I was driving a car I deserved. Let me ask you a question. What's, what's more important, a great marriage or cool cars? <laughs> what 
Which would you rather have? A lousy stinking, car, a lousy stinking marriage, but I got a cool car to drive around. It was good because you'll be living in that car. Better get a van. <laughs> down by the tracks, down by the river, whatever that thing is. The standard of living does not equate or equal our quality of life. It's not true. And some of you are there. You have stuff that you wish you didn't have today. You have payments on stuff that you wish you didn't have anymore. And your life looks more like this than it does like this. This stuff's important. How we deal with this area of our life, whether you're a believer in Christ or not, this is just practical stuff, practical stuff. If you're a believer in Christ, these are some things that we have to deal with that we don't have any option about. Stuff we have to deal with if we truly are a follower of Christ. Do you think that Jesus is more concerned or God? If God truly loves us, which he does, if he's truly concerned about our life and if he truly knows the hairs that are on our head, if he truly knows all that stuff, has it all figured out, if he truly does, do you think he's more concerned with your standard of living or your quality of life? Man, he's more concerned, far more concerned about your quality of life, about your peace and about your joy, about your relationships than he is about the stuff that's in your garage or in your storage shed. Far more concerned about those things. And so where do we go from here? What do we do? You see, if you go ahead and put that first chart up, this first chart just represents, you see on the left side, you know, the amount of money on the bottom is years. In a perfect world, this is what we would like our lives to look like, that there's a, just an increase in our financial uh, future, our financial picture. As we progress down the, jo- the road, the journey of life, our, our, you know, we're, we're making more you know, this decade than we were last decade. How many of you think that's just, you know, I mean, it just makes sense, right? We, we, want that to ha- we want that to happen. It might, you know, again, this is over the course of time, and there might be fluctuations. There might be a little bit up and down, and maybe you're in sales, or your income is tied to harvest, whatever it might be. There might be some of this. But over the course of our lifetime, we would prefer for our income to just steadily increase. Along with that, in a perfect world, this next chart, it represents our spending. What we would like to have happen along with our spending is that while we're spending, our spending is lower than our income. Now, how many of you just, that makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, I know this is not real deep. Just common sense. Sorry that I'm not giving you some deep, profound spiritual principle that you and I can't understand. It takes the sages of the ages to be able to help us figure out. But over the course of our lifetime, what we want to have happen is that while our spending or while our income is increasing, our spending might increase, but it's it's increasing at a at a rate that is less than or lower than our income. And you see that space in between there. That space in between there is this. That space in between there is peace. That space in between there is is we sleep better. That space in between there is that we're not at each other's throats because they spent without anybody knowing. It's not a phone call. It's not being afraid that the next letter you get or the next phone call you get is going to be, you know, somebody reminding you that you owe them money. I owe, I owe, it's off to work, I go. Life's not fun that way. You're not fun that way. There's pressure there. And none of us want that. But sadly, the case, and here's the thing that we need to understand. Remember, your standard of living is not equal to your quality of life. We understand, we know that just because you have what, you know, is the latest and the greatest does not mean that your quality of life is better. Now, this is a tough principle because, you see, living like this, it doesn't take any discipline at all. It's just easy. I can't get more time, and my finances are limited, but what I do with my finances aren't limited, and it doesn't take any discipline at all to have our garages full of stuff. This over here, it takes discipline. It takes discipline. It takes some decision. It takes some living intentionally. Now, as good Americans, we prefer debt and, <laughs> and, and undisciplined living to disciplined living and space. So let me give you something this morning to make you think, to ask you to think about something. To do what we're going to talk about this morning might require for your standard of living to decrease or to be less. But while your standard of living, living decreases, your quality of life will increase. Now that's counterintuitive to what we live, where we live. But you see, that's what that second chart was. That second chart is making decisions that my standard of living might be less, but my quality of life is way greater. Now, we don't want to live there. 
We want to have the latest, greatest, keep up with the Joneses, or at least drag them down to our level. That's what we want. But there's decisions that we have. And again, if you're not a believer in Christ, then you know what? Some of these things don't matter. But if you are a believer in Christ, they're very important. Because it's in that space. It's in that room. It's, it's, where, there's, it's where there's a little bit of margin that you can be generous, that you can follow God. But here's where most of us live. Go ahead and do with chart, chart three. Here's where, where a lot of people live. Our income and our spending are the same. Our income and spending, they track together. You see, rather than being wise, teach us to number our days so that we can apply our hearts to wisdom. Rather than, than, than living with wisdom, being intentional about some things, we allow our income to drive our spending. We allow the, mo- the amount of money that we make to drive the amount of money that I spend. If I make $40,000 a year, I will spend $40,000 a year. If I make $150,000 a year, well, I've gotten a raise. So I, because I got a raise, I'm now going to get the car that I deserve. And I'm going to get the address that, that everybody says that this in- income should have. And I'm going to get the flat screens and I'm going to get all of this stuff. And we allow our income to drive our spending. And we live... And it doesn't matter if you've got, if you're making $40,000 a year or $400,000 a year, the pressure is the same. Because you allow your spending, you allow your income to drive your spending. I make this much, so I'll spend this much. And that doesn't take any discipline at all, it just takes a paycheck. This requires discipline, it requires a decision. I want my quality of life to be better, so my standard of living might have to be a little bit lower. Now, here's where some people end up. This is the, when the uh-oh happens, when your spending is bigger or more than your income. And this can happen a lot of different ways. If you lose a job or, or perhaps, you know, a lot of places are, are restructuring and, and, and you're making less than you were making before. Government takes a bigger bite. Suddenly, you're bringing home less than you were bringing home before. Now, now the fun really begins because now you've got to, instead of having space, instead of having room where there's peace and, and, and where there's life and where there's joy, now you're living in a situation, man, you want to talk about some marriage problems? You want to talk about some arguments? You want to talk about having no fun and a life is sucked out of you because you're upside down? Now all of us know, <laughs> which is far better. All of us know, we want that. We would prefer this to this. So there's some decisions that we have to make. And and this is why understanding some of these things, making some decisions, and creating space in our life is so important. Again, Shelly and I, we know what this is like. We've lived there. And we've made decisions about our standard of living. There are things that are important to us, and there are things that are important to other people, but really not that important to us. And there are some things we'd like to have. We're just like you and me, or like everybody else, but there are things we want. But we've made some decisions about some stuff, and it's those decisions that have brought us to that place. And I can, again, I want to just stress this. I know what this is like, and this is, it might seem like you're buried and you'll never unbury. Trust me this morning. You can get out of this. I found this, and it's way, easier to, it's, it's way easier and quicker to end up like this than it is to end up like this. This is easy. takes no discipline. This is hard, and it's going to take some time, but it is so worth it. It is so worth it. I would do everything that I possibly can legally to get like this. <laughs> All right, legally. <laughs> All right. So again, where the heck is, where am I at? Now, here's, here's where I know that most of us are. First of all, three things. First of all, all of us are living on a percentage of our income. You might not know what that percentage is, but everybody here is living on a percentage of their income. Might be 100% of their income. Might be 110% of their income. You're in a problem if that's the case. All of us are living on a percentage of that income, and it would be important to know what that percentage of our income that we're living on is. Because... It's in that place and understanding that. And and really, I would say it this way. You need to decide as a husband or wife or a single, whatever you are, you need to make a decision about what that percentage will be. Because if you don't make that decision, somebody else will make that decision for you. If you don't make a decision about the 
percent of income that you will live on, you will allow your income to drive your spending and you will fill your life with all kinds of stuff. And instead of you deciding what percentage of your income you're going to live on, the car company, the mortgage company, the mall, the shoe store, the, the uh, you know, Bass Pro Shops and Cabela's are going to decide what income or what percentage of your income you're going to live on. And so you need to decide that. You need to make a decision about that. All of us live on a percentage of our income. Secondly, I think all of us probably feel like if we had just a little bit more, if we just had just a little bit more, everything would be fine. If we had just a little bit more, we'd be fine. If I just made another $5,000 a year, if I just made another $10,000 a year, then I would be fine. Here's the third thing that probably all of us are thinking this morning, particularly those of us that are are a little bit uh, farther along down the road. (laughs) I'll bet you thought the same thing when you made less money. Ten years ago, when you made $5,000 less, you thought, if I just made $5,000 more, I'd be fine. And here you are 10,000, 10,000, here you are 10 years later making $5,000 or more, and guess what? There's still pressure. There's still that feeling that I don't have enough if I just had a little bit more. More? More? That's how we live. If I just had more, rather than making a decision to lower my standard of living so that my quality of life would be greater. And the end result is that we're full of anxiety. We're full of fear. We're full of all that stuff that Jesus said, your heavenly father knows what things you have need of before you ask. Again, this is far better than that. And so when we live, if you go back to chart number three for just a moment, The reason that this is so important is because when we live like this, where our income and our spending are are tied together, that we allow our income to drive our spending, is because for the follower of Christ particularly, when we're living like this, Jesus really isn't our master, our money's our master. The Lord's not our master. Jesus is not our master. Our finances are our master. Jesus said this, In Luke 16, 13, no servant can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. You cannot serve God and money. And I know that, you know, so, well, yeah, I can. Yeah, you know, well, you know, who are you to talk to me about my money and what I do with my money is my choice. Yeah, it is. It is your choice. It really is your choice. But again, Jesus told us some things. He talked a lot about money because he knew some things. He knew about the deceitfulness of riches. He knew how money can affect us. And we'll see a scripture in just a moment. But Jesus also told us that where our heart or our treasure is, that's where our heart is. And he says, you can't serve God and you can't serve money. You see that, that place where there's margin, that place where there's room, where our income is greater than our expenses, in that place is where God can tap you on the shoulder to be a blessing. There's a lot of scriptures in the Bible that talk about one another, that we're to love one another, serve one another, that we're to bless one another, we're to care for one another. And yet many times because of the cares of life and the pressures, we can't care for one another, we can't love one another. When, when, when maybe we sense, man, I would just, I can't, and I've heard many people, Pastor, I just wish that I could, if I just could, but you know, right now, I can't. And sometimes there's seasons where we can't, but there's other times decisions that we've made that we can't. You know, fill in the blank, whatever it might be. We can't. I've lived there. I know what it's like to want to give to a cause and not be able to. I know what it's like to feel so guilty because I wanted to do something and I couldn't. I know what it's like. And there's a great joy in being able to be free to give, be generous to people. It's awesome to be able to do that. And that's the way that we're supposed to live. But when we sense something rising up in us that, man, I just wish I could and I want to, but I can't because MasterCard won't let me. I can't because the mortgage company won't won't let me. Who's your master? Who's your master? Is it Jesus or is it the credit card company? At that point in life, and I don't mean this to be condemning or anything. I don't want it to be. I'm trying, again, we're trying to help here this morning. If you're a younger person in here this morning like me, you know, us young people, we need to pay attention to these things because we, over the course of our lifetime, we're going to have a lot of money come through our hands that we're responsible for, that we're to be stewards of. So let me just give you a couple things this morning. 
If, you, if, if we can't, as he said, serve God and money, how do we create space financially? How do we live in that place where there's room? Here's a couple of things that I think, first of all, that, that probably we already know what to do. It's kind of like exercise. I don't know how to exercise. Yeah, you do. <laughs> well, I don't know what I should do. You probably do, but here's the first thing. First of all, make a decision. You need to decide. You need to decide that you're done living like this. You need to decide that this is better and we are going to do whatever we can legally do to get here. It's a decision. And you might think, this is the lot in life that I have. This is impossible. I will never get there. You might think that. And you might already be wondering, well, I I wish I could, I would, but how can I do this? Forget about the how right now. Like I said, you probably already know, but, but forget about the how right now. Just decide. This is that place that you begin to let God do the stuff that you can't do. This is the place that you begin to let God be God and do the miraculous on your behalf. That's the place when you first make that decision, God, I believe that this is possible. I believe that you want me to. And so I'm making a decision that I'm bringing change into my life. The second thing is you need to set a goal. You need to set a goal and decide what percentage you're going to live on. Again, might be unattainable. Your, your life might be like that, but set a goal. And don't make it 99% or 103%. Set a goal. What is the percent? I, I heard one person saying, I like this, 80%. I live on 80%. I give 10% to God, and I, and I save 10%. Now, you might come up with a different formula, something else may fit, but build space into your finances. The third thing you need to go is, go, uh, is to spy on your money. You need to know where your money's going. You, I kind of know where it's going, or I don't know, at the end of the month, I just it seems like it's gone. There's a scripture that talks about the person who has their money in a bag that has holes in it, and they just go through life, and suddenly it's like, where'd that money go? It's like it just dribbled out. You need to know where your money's going. Keep track of it. There's a ton of different software programs can help you with this stuff. It doesn't have to be rocket science. If you, get, if you don't have that, can't afford that, don't know how to do that, get a piece of paper. Follow your checkbook register. Some of you guys are using debit cards, and you just ch- 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 never keep track of it. You don't know where it's going. Find out. Spy on your money. You might be surprised whether you're spending your money. Number four, you need to cut spending. Or just raise your debt ceiling. But no, don't do that. You need to cut spending. And you can't cut spending if you don't know where your money's going. So cut spending. And and again, here's a great little principle. Do you know that that I want is way better than I owe? I want that new. I want that latest. I want that greatest is way better than I owe on that new. I owe on that latest and I owe on that greatest. I want is better than I owe. (laughs) <laughs> I just felt like there was some intentionality with that cough. <laughs> I want is better than I know. Again, I want, man, we fill our life with all the stuff I want. Now we owe on it. You might not be able to fill your life with all the stuff you want, but there's freedom and peace that comes with that. And then last but not least, develop a debt retirement plan. Develop a de- debt retirement plan. And, and let me just say it this way. Uh, where is it? Somewhere over here. What I would do, rather than nodding in agreement with me and say, yep, that's right, I probably should do something about this, while the emotion of the moment is still warm, what I would do is I would not walk, but I would run. I would run out the doors and over that way to the corner of the building and sign my name on a piece of paper under the class Financial Peace University. Because in that class, it is nine weeks. Oh, nine weeks to my life. It's so full. I just got everything here. I know it's hard. So hard. Nine weeks of your life. But in that nine weeks, there's information that is covered that is so valuable. Stuff you won't hear or find anywhere else. And it will help you. It is practical stuff. And, and, and the debt snowball is something that we did. I hated it with a passion. Did not make, it made sense to me. That's probably why I hated it. But I didn't like it at all. But we did it. I just thought there's just no way this is ever going to. And it did. 
It, it, it worked. So that debt retirement snowball thing, whatever, I felt like more like an avalanche had hit my house. And, and, and yet, if this is important to you, if you feel like your life is more like this than like this, I highly recommend. Man, do not assume that you know all of this stuff. Don't assume that somebody can't help you. Don't assume that nobody else knows what you're going through. Because people are, and people know, and people can help you. That's what they want to do. In, Mark, in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 20, it says, lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys or thieves, uh, or where thieves do not break in and steal for where your treasure is, there your heart is also. This is why Jesus talked so much about money because he knew that our heart and our treasure were tied together. Where your heart is, your treasure is. Where your treasure is, your heart is. Wherever your treasure goes, whatever your treasure is invested in. I, like what one, I heard one person say one time, they said that, I never cared about a particular stock. I never cared about a particular company until I found out that my portfolio was invested in that or I made an investment in that company and suddenly I cared about it. Never knew about it, never cared about it until I had some money in it and then I cared about it. I wanted to make sure that that company did well. I wanted to make sure that that company was successful. I wanted to make sure why? Because my money was there. And I think that's why Jesus said that where your treasure is, your heart is. If, if we invest in eternal things, if we invest in the kingdom of God, our heart goes there. We care about its success. We care about how it does. We care about how it expands and how it grows. We care about how it's represented. And I think that's why Jesus gave us that principle. Face it, the biggest enemy of our heart, not always the devil. It's not always people. It's not your in-laws or your outlaws. Most of the time. It's where we direct our heart through our giving. There's a battle. There's a fight. There's a tension for your heart. And, and Jesus didn't die just for part of your life. He died for all of your life. He wants to be the Lord of all, not the Lord of some. Amen? So this is all stuff you kind of know. But it's stuff that <laughs> you need to do. Amen? Would you please stand with me this morning? If you uh, were here and you had, didn't get a roll, you didn't get some dough, make sure and get some on your way out, but let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, again, we thank you for this time that we could be together. And Lord, I thank you that, <sighs> Father, we just thank you for your love for us. And Father, if there are those who are here today that maybe are like the one cabinet that is full, that is disorganized, that feels like they're under the weight and the pressure that they'll never get out from under it, I pray, Father, that the words that were spoken today, that, Father, it would bring encouragement to their life, that faith would arise within them. And, Father, we stand with each one and we join our faith. Father, we know that all things are possible if we'll just believe you. And so, Lord, we create room in our heart to believe you. We create room in our heart to expect you for better. And, Lord, we believe that as we begin to apply principles of, of discipline to our heart and to our life, that, Father, you'll make a way where there seems to be no way, that you'll exalt every valley, that you'll make every mountain low. Even the mountains of debt, Father, I thank you that they're brought low, that they're no match for you. And so, Father, we thank you for all of those things. In the mighty name of Jesus, and everyone said, amen.